everyone, and welcome to the Chef's Table Series, an educational cooking show. I am co-host Carol O'Connor, and we are in the beautiful, bustling Newburyport in Massachusetts. We are featuring Chef Jeremy Glover of Saya Kitchen and Bar. He will be teaching us how to make chicken with mushroom juicelle served with a parmesan fonduto as well as a broccolini. And later on, you'll see my, the beer that's going to be paired with this dish, as well as my interview with the owner of this beautiful, rustic-looking restaurant, Nancy Batista Caswell. So let's bring this over to Joe and Chef Jeremy to learn how to make this delicious dish. Hi, I'm Chef Joe Murphy, co-founder of the Chef's Table Foundation. This foundation was created three years ago and our mission is to support homeless U.S. veterans in transition or a homeless young adult in need also in transition with a culinary school education. So by you watching and each week we try to have an audience and that supports our work. So we're very pleased today to be at a absolutely great restaurant in the historic Newbury Port. Uh, when Carol and I came to meet the owner and we walked around the town and we just loved it. But then we said, let's go back and eat. And I've got to tell you, Chef, the food was absolutely delicious. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. No, I mean, it was really great. I wish I had a little more pasta in the bowl, but it was absolutely <laughs> delicious. Uh, but in any event, uh, tonight, tonight we're here with Chef uh, Jeremy Glover, the executive chef yep. at Saya Restaurant. Did mm -hmm. I pronounce Saya correctly? Yeah, Saya Kitchen and Bar. Okay, great. And uh, we started talking about your background. So you've been in a kitchen for 11 years or so? I've been, I mean, cooking's the only job I've ever had. Right. Well, dishwashing and then into cooking. But right. yeah, yeah, that was the only job I've ever had. Right. So You know, a lot of great chefs, and we've had some really top chefs on this show, from Union Oyster House to one of the Davios to Paul Wahlberger, a fellow by the name of Steve LeCount, who was the executive chef at the Country Club in Chestnut Hill. He's trained all over the world. A and most of them started washing dishes. Yeah. Process along. All righty. So you have a, a, a chicken there? Yeah, so um, these are Commonwealth. They're from Commonwealth poultry farm. Mm -hmm. uh, it's out of, I think it was Gardner, Maine. Okay. Um, and they are an air chilled chicken. So they, um, they're free range, they're air chilled. So air chilled is when they're um, butchered, they actually, instead of like cooling them quickly into like a bath of water, which is what a lot of your like commodity chicken is, this is uh, air cooled. So they run it through um, basically like I wouldn't say freezer, but really, really cold temperatures to drop the temperature of the meat. Does it go through an air tunnel, cold air Yeah, tunnel? so it's basically like a long walk-in refrigerator, and they just mm -hmm. run it through there until it bring, comes down to temp, and then they package them. Wow. So it's not frozen? It's, it's good, not frozen, no. Good chill on it. So they, it, cool, it brings the, after the bird's slaughtered, it brings the temperature of the bird down to where it's, no, it's not in the, um, I guess, range where you'll get sick. Yeah. The, the idea. The bacteria count won't grow exponentially. Right. Okay. Now I'm just looking at this. I see that you've taken the wings, the legs. Yeah. Uh, is this galantined? Uh, no. So okay. I'm not sure the term, um, but it is. Uh, legs and thighs are off. Wings are off. We take the wishbone out. Yeah. We call it on the cage. Um, so okay. the cage is the actual like breastbone. Yeah. Um, wishbone's out and the backbone's out for ease of cooking because we need like quicker pickups. But I don't want to. We don't want to sacrifice quality either. Mm -hmm. So we cook it on the cage. Mm -hmm. um, so 
And then we actually leave them in the walk-in, um, uncovered after they've been uh, stuffed to create kind of a pellicle formation, or pellicle, um, mm -hmm. which is enzymes that create on the top to create like a nice, um, they dry it out and like create like a nice surface for when you sear, the sear will actually become greater from the, um, I guess, enzymes that are on the actual skin. Wow, that's a great tip. I've never had anybody talk about that. So once you stuff it, you put it in the refrigerator? Yeah, uncovered. Uncovered. Yep. And then it develops somewhat of a skin yep. when the enzymes come out? Yeah, so it's, it's the same thing, thing if you were to smoke like smoking food, mm -hmm. you want to do that so the smoke adheres to the skin. Great, okay. And galantine, it, it's just a French term, and you can bone out a whole chicken. Yes. Even take the leg bones out, the thigh bones, and leave the whole chicken, the, the flesh and the skin intact, and then you can stuff it, stuff the legs, the dark meat, the thigh bones, and then just tie it back up. And but uh, this is a great technique as well. Yeah, so yeah, this is how we do it at the restaurant. It's how we um, fjord our chicken. This is what it's coming off of. Excellent, wow. So do you cook the whole chicken or just a brown? Uh, we'll cook the whole thing. Wow, so that's your serving? Uh, no, we do one. So with the other side, we, um, it will go to the next table. So the pickup time on the next table will be a little less. Okay. Um, and we actually will only cook it to like medium well. Yeah. Um, and then, so when we carve it, we just pick up the other side to um, finish cooking. Wow, great. So is this a, on your menu, or is it a sp special? No, this is on the menu. It is, wow, great, great. Now, what do you stuff this with? You uh, so it's stuffed with a mushroom duck cell. Mm. So we take uh, button mushrooms, and we soak them in water to kind of wash them, mm -hmm. and they actually absorb a little bit of the water as well. Um, and then we sweat that down in a little bit of that water, um, or new water without the dirt. And then uh, that, as that's reducing, we add shallots and garlic and thyme. Mm. And then we cook that all the way down until the liquid starts to caramelize in the bottom of the pan. And then we deglaze with cognac. And then that kind of cooks out. And then we cool the mushrooms that are now like glazed in cognac herbs and shallots and garlic. Mm. Um, and then that gets cooled. And then we um, food process that up and mount, mount it with creme fraiche. So th that was an incredible uh, recipe that you just spoke about, and it sounds so delif delicious. I can't wait to try it. Uh, my question is, can I come home with you? Uh, the house I'm living at right now is pretty stuffed, but I don't see why not. Okay. Just give me a sleeping bag. Yeah, if you're cooking like we got this, room for yeah. sleeping bags and whatnot. Okay, great. All right, so where do we go from here? What's next? Uh, so now we salt it. Um, so, pretty liberal with the salt. Yeah. Um, you want to make sure you get everywhere that, um, I guess, is exposed or that's going to be actually hitting the pan. Mm -hmm. So, why are you, what does that accomplish by making a, a liberal uh, um, You want it to there? kind of be enough to carry through the actual piece of meat. Yeah. Because um, if you go too light, it's going to, you're not going to, when you're eating, say, the meat that's on the bone in there, that's not actually getting salted. You want that to, the salt to carry through. Okay. And also when you sear, some of this will, some of it will um, come off in the oil, Cook some of it off. will, right. 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 Now, what type of oil do you sear this in? Uh, we use sunflower. Sunflower, okay. Yeah, so we use sunflower oil, mm -hmm. um, and we use olive oil for finishing, and that's right. the olive oil we yeah. use. I'm going to actually grab a sanitizer. Yeah, bucket. and I'm sure, you know, this is kind of sanitizer talking about bucket. different oils. Uh, I have a friend uh, who does a segment on the show, and he loves great tea oil, but try to find it, in, you know, on the shelf. It's very difficult. And cooking with canola oil, it has a it's much more resistance uh, to heat, yeah. so you're Let's not going to get it burning and smoking, as opposed to an olive oil. I happen to use a lot of olive oil if I'm searing, but I really try to watch it because it has a very low tolerance to heat, as opposed to the unflavored oils you can use. Okay. So, what do you have there, Chef? 
Uh, so this is the, um, I guess, accompaniments for the chicken dish. Um, so it's a little broccolini. It's some uh, king oyster mushrooms from the New Hampshire Mushroom Company. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, these are just going to get seared um, like three quarters of the cooking, throughout the cooking process right. for this. Right. So they're cooked in chicken fat and a little bit of sunflower. Nice. Yeah, that's great. You know, one point I want to make, it, it, two things. You add this when the chicken's about three quarters cooked. Yep. And that's a great tip. Understand how long, and you, obviously you pro, if you haven't done this type of uh, a cut of chicken before, you'd have to maybe try it a couple of times, unless you're a genius like, like you. Mm. And um, add the, the, the other vegetables that are only gonna take a quarter of the time. Right. Otherwise, you're gonna wind up with burnt, caramelized, overcooked mush. So, you know, again, thinking through the whole process. But a lot of times, it just takes a little bit of, you know, doing it a couple of times. Um, yeah, so at home, we roast a lot of chickens, me and my wife, and uh, we actually will roast the chicken on top of vegetables. Yeah. So we just, you just cut your vegetables larger, or yeah. you use a full carrot opposed to a cut carrot. Right. Um, right. So that's how we will do that at home. So uh, is it a mirepoix that you're putting under there? Uh, no, we'll do like um, onions, carrots, um, and then we'll do like cauliflower. Potatoes, okay. sweet right. potatoes, all squash. Right. Nice, yeah. And that's picking up all the flavors. Yeah. From the and then when you, we will just throw that in the fridge after too. Yeah. And then the vegetables will actually sit in all the juice and the fat. And then that you just warm up the next day, and it kind of like caramelizes onto the vegetables. Vegetable, yeah. You know, if you're trying this and you say, oh gee, all that chicken fat, it's not like you're eating this every day. If you have a dish like this once a month. Yeah. If you have at least once a week, I'll definitely be over. <laughs> but, you know, I always say moderation. If you're concerned about the fat and the cholesterol, which is a good thing to be concerned, but just don't eat rich food every night. You know, treat yourself. Yeah, it's also um, chicken fat is, I would say, a little better for you than even like your uh, Crisco or something like that. Yeah. So. I think a little chicken fat is uh, good for you, in my opinion. Good. I'm not a doctor, though. Right. Well, I know your food is fantastic. Thank so you. So I'm going to go along with whatever you say. Cool. All right. So you have your chicken ready. You've yeah. got your mise en place ready for your finishing yep. the chicken. And then you add these. Again, cooking is building a lot of flavors. Right. So you're gonna cook these in the in the yeah. So we do a lot of one pan pickups. It also helps with the volume that we actually do because on the summers we will do 200, 300 people. Um, so to actually cook that and you can see, I mean, this is our kitchen that we do cook out of. So to actually put that out and to be having three or four pans going for one dish is kind of um, a waste of space, and right. it also helps improves flavor. Yeah, I agree. And that's the point I was getting at. Right. I like the idea that you're cooking these in the fat from the chicken. Yeah. And get a great flavor. We so also will, um, we make a pan sauce in the pan after. So nice. we'll drain off some of the fat and then we'll deglaze yeah. with uh, chicken stock and then we'll blow that down and mount it with butter. Woo. Unsalted butter? Unsalted butter. Very good. Now are you going to? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, great. Do you use a lot of cast iron for this? Uh, yeah, so we sear basically all our meat and fish in cast iron. Um, it's nice on the line because we can wipe it out. Right. Or just if it's really burnt or if there's a lot of buildup, just put a little water in it, boil it out, wipe it out with some oil, and you're ready to rock and roll again. Yeah, right. Doesn't have, you don't have to wait for the dishwasher or anything. Sure, sure. Um, we only have three cast irons, and we basically sear all our steaks and chickens in them. Wow, great, yeah. Yeah, because you've... I'm sure you're doing most of your, your proteins, other than maybe a fish, if you're searing, you're finishing in the oven. 
Uh, the meat, yeah, definitely. Well, the chicken. Our steaks, we finish right on the stove. Oh. We'll baste them with butter until they're um, wow. cook, cooked to whatever temp they need to be. Right. So on using butter when you're doing the steak, do you have to be careful on the butter browning and yeah. burning? Or Again, that's something you add at the end. Yeah. Um, so that way you can control that because right. you don't want to be basting with burnt butter unless that's the flavor you're looking for. Right. Um, a little burnt or browned to a little dark butter on a steak I don't think is going to... No, it gives yeah. a nice nutty flavor, yeah. but for the home cook that's not used to it, you know, I was hoping you would say what you said. Use that at the end. It's yeah. a finishing product. Yep. So you don't want to, you know, sauteing mushrooms with butter. It's not a good idea. No because by the time those mushrooms are done, that butter's gonna be burnt. Yeah, you also need, uh, I think, high heat, a high heat oil for like a mushroom because yeah. the there's so much water in mushrooms. Right. It just bleeds out and ends up like poaching. Yeah. Which is why, the I mean, that's what the duck cell is. It's basically you're poaching the mushrooms, creating a mushroom stock and then reducing that mushroom stock and then glazing them in that stock in the cognac and a creme fraiche. Wow, okay. Now, another thing I wanna mention you get your you must get your pants smoking hot yeah yeah because when you add your protein it's going to drop the temperature of your pan yeah and it also helps with sticking right so that pan uh, that chicken gets in there do you move it around no okay um so we will we'll sear the top part um I guess the top side of the breast. We'll see that skin until it's nice and crispy. And then um, we'll actually tip it on its side because we're trying to get um, as much coverage of the sear right. as possible. And it also speeds up um, cooking, which is something we're looking for in the restaurant. Right. Um, because we do do a fair amount of volume. Right. To so. me, that's a great sound. Yeah. I had this guy telling me, oh, I don't cook with high heat anymore. I turned it down to medium to towards low. Yeah. I said, you're not going to get caramelization. Which is a lot of flavor. Right. You're not going to get, again, it'll bleed out, dry it out. It'll start poaching a little bit, depending on what the cut of meat is or yep. poultry. So you want a fairly hot pan. And don't be afraid of it. If it's too hot, just take it off that burner and move it over and let it come down to, you know, a, a, a better temperature to cook with. Right. Okay. So, once this is browned, yeah. okay, then you, you turn it so over. So, yeah, once it's brown on that side, we're going to tip it on its side and sear on the sides there yeah. where there is a fair amount of breast meat still there as well. Yeah. Um, and then right before it goes in the oven, I will put, like, a fair amount of butter right in the um, cavity yeah. and then as it cooks that butter will melt and then I'll add my vegetables in that butter and chicken nice. fat Excellent. and then we also can baste the chicken as it comes out and we check on it right. um, yeah. and that also helps crisp up the skin and add yeah. uh, lens flavor. Wow. So uh, you know the magic of video uh, when you're under time constraints uh, you have you have one that's already prepared, right? I sure do. Okay, great. Yeah, so I'll bring this back and grab that one. Okay, great. So just remember, uh, if you don't mind, Chef, you know, you want to sear all sides yep. before you put it in the oven? Yeah, so we'll sear the side, say that's seared, and then right. I'll take it and we'll just tip it on its side. Yeah. Tip it on its side yeah. and just let it sit on that for a little bit. Yeah. And also when you do baste, these sides will get, um, they won't really get seared, but it will kind of lend brownness and sure. um, what you're looking for. If you want to leave that and then we can show them the finished product, okay. it's up to you. I'll go fire this in the oven. Okay. Right. Yeah, this is a fabulous dish. I just all these different ingredients he's using. Is that chicken for them? Just bringing all those flavors together. Is that my and his technique cool. is fantastic. So uh, I can't wait to make up their own afterwards. And uh, I thought when I looked when he started, like, and I saw the two breasts, and this is done. Done. Like, done. 
you have to be a 400 pound gorilla to eat all this that. This is John Dundee. Uh, Vlad cool. said it's, you know, he breaks it in half. Um, and I want to ask the chef when he comes out, I uh, when you're working in your kitchen, I like to have a bone there if I can. I, I just think it really adds to the finished product, the flavor, and, and uh, helps keep the product moist. I take a little bit longer, but it, it's really great. So, uh, he'll be right along, and uh, we'll get this thing going here. Oh boy! Oh, look at that! So that's the uh, final product. And do you serve it on this? Um, no, oh, we yeah. will actually um, carve it. So uh, once the chicken comes out, we let it rest. Um, that's a big important thing I think a lot of home cooks don't actually hit on. Right. Um, because when you do rest a meat, um, it relaxes. And it, when you sear it, it gets super tense. Um, everything sets right up. And then all the juice or blood or fluid runs towards the center, getting away from the heat. And then when you rest it, that uh, juice liquid um, kind of comes back out to the surface because it's no longer screaming hot. Right. Great. That's a great tip. And it doesn't mean if it's chicken, beef. Beef, pork. Or anything. You know, let that rest. I don't know if there's any particular time that you would how long you would let something rest? I mean, if it cools off, you can always just, if your pan, just warm your pan back up, and you should be able to just kind of kiss it, warm yeah. it up, and yeah. that should be that. Okay, good. Um, so let's set this right there. Okay. Excellent. Um, so now, uh, when breaking down a chicken, there's a keel bone mm -hmm. right in the middle. Um, we've taken the wishbone out, so mm -hmm. that is, um, that's usually an issue as well. That's where you're, um, I guess it's like their collarbone. Mm -hmm. So just cut down, um, follow the cage down, mm -hmm. and we leave the, uh, or we try to leave, the um, little drumette, I guess is the name for it. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, just follow that up. Yeah. And you know, a sharp knife is really a good knife, so. Yeah. You know, he, he just made that so easy because he's got a great knife. Uh, yeah, it makes a world of difference, yeah. a sharp knife. Especially when doing like little tasks or things that yeah. need to be done quickly. Yeah, a knife is, is not a chisel. It should be, you should be able to slice with it and work with it. You know, it drives me crazy if I'm at somebody's house and I see them pushing down instead of slicing. So keep that knife sharp. Yeah. So I'm just gonna slide this yeah. over. Okay. Reach back here. Do you guys have chicken sides? This yeah, really I smells need them right great. Now. So that's carved off, um, and always check to make sure that's not uh, like pink, pink. Yeah. That little bit's fine, I think, because it's been up against the bone. Um, so now uh, we are gonna plate it. Okay. Now you guys took away my plate. Do you have parm fondue? Yeah, and Chef just took the cage, took the, the breast meat off of the cage. And that's what that is. Yeah, and those we save and we'll make stocks with. Right. So we'll actually um, take the leg, the leg bones, the cages, uh, the wings we'll eat for staff meal. Yeah. Um, and then the cages we'll cook down to make stock. And that's what we actually do, um, like our pan sauces with. And a lot of our pastas we use chicken stock. Yeah. Yep. Sounds great. Okay. So there's that. I'll take them. 
you know, if if this was actually the kitchen, I, this is what we're talking about. Right now. Decent class. We just don't have enough time to put all the product here, and it's that running back that can interrupt your cooking experience. And if you like me, I love to cook, so. So, um, we have a little bit of parm fonduta. So we take our parm rinds and we cook it down in cream. Oh. And uh, so that eliminates some waste that you would have with parm. Um, we serve parm on our cheese boards. And then uh, that is actually gonna be the sauce that the chicken is gonna sit in. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about parmesan? Rinds? Yeah, parm rinds. Wow, and you cream them? Uh, we cook them down in cream. So basically making a parm stock using cream. Wow. So the cheese flavor will carry through on the parm, or the che cheese flavor will carry through on the heavy cream. Great, great tip. So, a little yeah. bit of this. Yeah. And I'm guessing for the home cook, they could freeze those yeah. parm. Yeah, could probably freeze it in like ice cube trays. Yeah so that you don't have to waste it. If you buy it in a wedge or a block, you know, you can use the, the, the palm rind and freeze it, and then when you want to use it, take it out. Yeah. You're not wasting anything. Okay. All right. So here's the palm fondue that goes on the plate. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, this is actually cold, but. All right. A little bit of that. Um, and then we're going to take our broccolini and our mushrooms. These are shiitakes and king oysters. Wow. And create a little movement on the plate. And then the chicken, we'll pull the tender off. Mm -hmm. And put the chicken at one end and then the tender at the other. Very nice. And then, uh, we got a little sauce. Do we have pan sauce working? Oh, this is a great dish. I gotta tell you. Uh, and then a little bit of uh, reduced chicken stock. Okay. And then this goes over the chicken. Nice. And a little bit on the tender. So you, you on this chicken stock, you roasted the bones and everything to get yeah. the darker yep. stock as opposed to putting it with water and cooking it down that way. Um, yeah, so we roast our bones to create depth to the stock. Um, yeah. And we also, we do cook it down in water as well. So we mm -hmm. roast the bones, they go in water, and then they cook overnight. Yeah. So about like six to eight hours. Right. Um, and then that gets strained and then we reduce that. Right. And when you're making a stock, you're not letting it boil, you're letting it just simmer. Correct? Yeah, you want it just below simmer. Right. Because what happens is you get all that cloudy, the particles start floating, so you don't want to, you want the long extended cooking, let it cook down slowly and just barely ripple. Yeah, all the fat and the impurities will rise to the top and right. that will be what's kind of set yeah. on top. Right, okay. When you have those impurities on top, how do you get those off? Do you skim them or? Right, you're gonna skim them with, uh, with a ladle. That's yeah. what we would use. Yeah. And you just kind of push the ladle down to where the liquid is uh, kind of displaced by the ladle and you just kind of tip the edge of the ladle and the fat will kind of run in oh, yeah, and the yeah. stock will stay right where it is. Yeah, I, I had a chef work from, with me one time and he whipped up egg whites and then he laid it right across the top and right. it almost made a cake. And as it's simmering and cooking, it's drawing all those you know, little particles yeah. of fat that you don't want in the finished product. Yeah, so that's a, that's a consomme. Um, we do that here for our, um, like our pat, our pate and croutes. We do uh, some terrines and things like that. Um, oh. We do a soup every now and then of the consomme. Wow, very good. All right, so where are the mushrooms on there? Mushrooms are on there. Oh wow, so that is your plated meal, That's which it. is great. Now, do you serve this with anything else generally? 
Um, we might garnish it in the window. I have some sorrel here that we um, mm -hmm. usually would garnish it with. Right. Um, and then we'll finish it with some salt as well, which well, is some of the celery. Right. And then this just kind of adds a little citrus, citrus to it, um, mm -hmm. a little brightness because it is such right. a rich dish. Okay. How about a cob? Do you do a risotto, a pasta? Or um, no, not on this dish. Um, I think it's, it is spring, so I don't have a lot of carbs on my menu right now besides right. our pastas. Right. Um, we also just started doing a pasta tasting, so that is oh. kind of like, if you're looking for that, we have um, four courses of pasta wow. and different preparations and things like that. Great. Well, this has been a great show, very instructional, which is what we like and hope to achieve, and uh, you've done a great job. So I'm sure the audience is, are they drooling? Can you see them? Uh, no. no. <laughs> um, do we need bibs? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. They might, they might need bibs. All right. So we do have a live audience here, and I'm going to ask them, what do you think, folks? Huh? Great, great job. Very good job. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to be the big up-and-coming star, aren't you? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I think you've, you've got the talent, that's for sure. Thank you. So, anyways, and this restaurant, the ambiance, this older, old world look with brick walls, beam ceilings, it's just, it's just a great, warm feeling. And uh, so, in closing, obviously, we'd like to thank you for watching the Chef's Table series, and again, Keep in mind that we are supporting homeless U.S. veterans and homeless young adults with a culinary school education. And our veterans, if you have veterans at home or relatives that are currently serving, give them a hug, send them a note, and thank them because we certainly appreciate their service. If you want to re-watch this show, you can watch it if you go to chefstableseries.tv and we have this show plus many other shows on there and if you have an iPad and you want to try this recipe play the show while you're cooking okay and maybe you can become his executive sous chef how's that sounds good okay great so please watch the show enjoy the food and thank you again for watching Hello everyone and welcome to this week's craft beer pairing. I'm Carol O'Connor. We're here at Vero Farm filming our craft beer. I am here with Kelsey Roth. He's a certified Cicerone. So I asked Kelsey to choose a beer that would go well with the chicken and mushrooms ducal, I hope I pronounced yeah. that right, by um, Executive Chef Jeremy Glover of Sia Kitchen and Bar in Newburyport. So which one did you, oh, Spencer. Yes. Oh, so, people love this beer. So this is brand new from the monks at St. Joseph's Abbey in Spencer, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And this is a German style Pilsner that they did. And it's called Fire, Fire Abend Beer. Great job. Which, <laughs> uh, which basically means in German, um, it's like the, uh, the evening beer, um, but it's also, they call it uh, the well-deserved beer. And it's kind of like oh. the beer that you have after work uh, to kind of enjoy oh, with yeah. the family. Yep. Um, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, so, the, so they're kind of you know, doing a few different things that you don't normally see Trappist breweries do mm -hmm. in Monk's Brew. Um, but this beer I picked because that Ooh. mushroom ducal yes. and you know, the Parmesan fondudo, mm -hmm. uh, you know, these are some really earthy flavors uh, that <laughs> exactly. you know, like with the mushrooms and, and everything like that. Yep. So I wanted a beer that uh, would, would match those flavors but not... Uh, really add more earthiness. You don't want too much earthiness right. in, a, in, a, you know, yeah. in your beverage and, and food. So this beer, it's, it uses classic German ingredients like German hops and malts, and it gives a little bit of an herbal kind of grassy note yes. to it. And then it's really carbonated, almost like a champagne, so that carbonation oh. is really going to help with the cream sauce and, mm -hmm. and all that to kind of cut through the, the richness. 
It has a little bit of that you know, kind of herbal. Ting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> little herbal kick to it, a little bitterness to it. Yeah. And uh, and I get a little bit of that malt sweetness, uh, almost like a like sweet corn mm. that. Uh, or like a, almost like a like a baked bread kind yes, of sweetness yeah. to it um, on the finish, and that's going to really help. I think that sweetness is going to balance out the earthiness. But uh, this is just a nice, refreshing, mm. you know, uh, light beer that has a little touch of bitterness that I think is going to go really nice with those mushrooms right. and chicken. And like you said, you could definitely drink this on its own. Like, mm -hmm. you know, some people have wine, I don't have one. Some people have beer, but this is a nice, tasty beer to do that. Yeah, and this this style, you know. Can mm -hmm. go well with a lot of different dishes. Yes, um, but it's going it. particularly well with the with uh, the mushroom ducal. Oh, perfect! All right, well, Kelsey, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. So, everyone, this has been the craft beer pairing of Chef Jeremy Glover's chicken with mushrooms ducal with Parmesan fonduto, and I'm Carol O'Connor. And I'm Kelsey Roth, a proud supporter of the Chef's Table Foundation. <laughs>
I, just for under 20 pounds. Oh, that's amazing. That's a beautiful machine. It is. It is. And it's customized actually for our store. It's, uh, that's why it's red. You can, oh. you, can, yeah, you can ask for different colors. Yeah, and you can... I love it. It's very <laughs> industrial looking. It goes well with the brick in here and the, the right. excellent way you decorate it. Oh. I love it. It's so warm and comforting. So everyone, this has been the coffee segment on the Chef's Table series. I'm here with owners Hector and Miriam Morales of Recreo Coffee and Roastery in West Roxbury. See you next time. Thank you. and welcome to the interval segment of the Chef's Table series. I'm Carol O'Connor, co-host. I am here in Newburyport, where I am at Sia Kitchen and Bar. And Sia means supper in Portuguese. So with me today is Nancy Batista Caswell. She is the proprietor and wine director of Sia. So Nancy, thank you so much for being here with me. Thanks for having me, thanks. and thanks for joining us here in Newburyport. I love Newburyport. Mm -hmm. Joe and I, um, you know, you're a dame. Mm -hmm. I'm a dame, and um, we came upon it, and I'm like, um, from emailing you, and I just love, love this town. Yeah, it's a really great waterfront community. I mean, obviously, a lot of people refer to it or think about it more so when it comes to the season of spring and summer, but mm -hmm. really beautiful in the fall, and mm -hmm. with the mild winter that we just had, it's it's been great to be exactly. here. Exactly. Yeah. Now tell me, are you at this time, you own two restaurants. Yes. So tell me how you started with your first one, then Sia, and then we'll let everyone know about the third. Yes, come. sure. So we opened um, Sia here in uh, 2010, and actually mm -hmm. we were at our old space, which was a diagonally across the street, 25 State Street. Uh, it opened as a 50-seat restaurant, and uh, it was in that location for about two years and just had glowing reviews and people were really excited about it. We had the opportunity to expand, so we did. And now we're in this space that we're re recording here today. And it's um, three floors and vertical, and we tripled in size to about 150 seats. Wow. Um, and trying to maintain that sta same European-focused menu. Mm -hmm. So our own you know, cheeses and, and producing charcuterie and making our own pastas and butchering all of our own fish and beef oh, wow. um, here in-house, our breads, and, and really kind of sticking to that heritage mm -hmm old world style cooking um, with the wine kind of pairing um, more on that European feel as well focusing on Italy France Spain and Portugal um, and then about three and a half years ago yes. because when we moved here I really enjoyed the intimacy of our space across the street I stuck with um, with that location and opened up brine which is a steak and oyster crudo bar and it was our vision of just really interpreting surf and turf in a, in a more sophisticated, elaborate way. So prime beefs are an option there, ribeye, steak, um, butcher chops, like lamb chops, pork chops, etc. And then we offer um, caviars, a selection of like six or seven wow. different oysters, and, um, and then some small plates there as well. So really just um, enjoying the kind of waterfront community that we have here and celebrating, you know, the bounty of of what we're able to get, to get here in beautiful New England. Beautiful. And then you're opening up a third one. Yeah. So for about two years now, we've been really focused on expanding our group into the city. Uh, we fell upon this beautiful building in uh, Fort Point, right outside of the seaport on A Street. Oh, Totally perfect. historic A Street. Yeah. yeah. And very much like our current locations here in Newburyport uh, with brick and beam and all the posts and stuff, we just felt like it was the right space for us. Uh, so that location, Oak and Rowan, mm -hmm. uh, 
it will open at 319A Street this fall, um, hoping, fingers crossed, for the Labor Day weekend. And that style menu will be kind of a collaboration of the two formats here in Newburyport, predominantly um, brine in the surf and surf aspect of things, but incorporating a little bit of the old world pastas. But by using it in, or producing the doughs, for example, with like a lobster roe or a caviar dough. So the seafood is still present in those dishes versus just a traditional yeah. Um, dough, yeah. It's because you'll add your own flair to it, your chef. Mm -hmm. And who's gonna, what chef is gonna be opening Oak and Rowan? So the executive chef of brine has yeah. actually been with me for several years now. He joined us when Saya was across the street, mm -hmm. moved it here with me, opened brine with me, and now we'll go to Oak and Rowan oh. as the lead chef. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of trust in him. Yes, have a good relationship for sure. With him. For the most part, across the board, we have such great culture within all of our organization, mm -hmm. and that's the reality of being able to expand. Uh, without that, obviously, we wouldn't be able to do so. So as much as you know, it's a personal interest of mine to be able to grow and expand mm -hmm. into the city, it's very much you know, being able to offer the ability for growth as well within our company and our, and our frontline staff. That's right. Now, what got you into the food and the wine industry? Because you started very young, correct? Yeah. So I started down in Westport, Massachusetts with Chef Chris Lessinger, who oh, yeah, yeah. owned East Coast Grill and, yeah. of course, the Back Eddie. And I started, um, you know, years and years before that at a donut shop and just fell in love with, you know, the, the grind of, really, hospitality. So when I started working for Chris, I started through the ranks of bus girl and mm -hmm. food runner and hostessing and serving. and. Um, I, I think he naturally saw this organic ability for me to be able to run the floor, so he asked me to be the floor assistant GM at the time, and I was going to Johnson & Wales, so I jumped at the opportunity, but at the same time made sure I you know, signed an agreement with my family that I was going to continue with school. <laughs> and I stayed at the Back Eddy for several years until um, that location being s seasonal in style, so it would close. So while I was in school, it was beneficial, so I would have some time to myself. But once I was out of school, you know, to to have those three months off seemed, you know, silly for me. Right. So I, I took the what I'd learned there and kind of moved into a different waterfront community, which was here in Newburyport, and um, and spent a little bit of time in Boston be before opening Saya. Wow, mm -hmm. that's a good experience. Now, how about your love for wine? How yeah, that start? my love for wine. <laughs> Who doesn't love wine? It didn't start at a young age. <laughs> um, so my, I always had a strong interest in wine just because I grew up in, in a family right. that, you know, being Portuguese, where food and wine was very much a part of um, you just everyday celebration, you know, sitting down, say I really supper and feasting. Yep. Um, was, was just that. When my mom would cook, it would be for the masses. We would always joke that she was feeding this army. And it was always from scratch cooking. You know, we never really ate, fortunate for us, like out of a box or anything right. unless it was like canned sardines <laughs> but um and then you know my grandfather was uh basically making his own wine too and stomping on the grapes right downstairs so oh. it was kind of always an experience that you know left a memory with me yeah. really and um so so with wine I think when I started working at bin 26 in Boston I really started oh, yeah, to think about yeah. that and it was a European wine list and worked with really great individuals there that really kind of showed me the way about it too. And I started tasting wine and really kind of appreciating it for different styles and boutique and respecting the families and their respect for what they were producing. So focusing more on quality versus supply. So that is challenging when you're producing a wine list to, you know, to fear or not necessarily fear, but worry about you know how long it can last on your list yeah, because you know there's only small productions of certain things and dealing with you know pre-sales and such. So before it hits the market, a lot of these really fantastic wines are already committed to different restaurants. So being organized and learning, okay, when do these come out and when right. do those come out and when do you get your waters in? Um, and and right now in Newburyport, we sh we sell so much rosé. It's really beneficial for the staff here and yeah. for our customers. I mean, we we flush through about like 98 cases of rosé. If you can really? think about that, yeah. Well, it's such a light, beautiful tasting. Oh yeah. Wine. I mean, for sure. And it's it's a cocktail wine. It's yes, um yeah. you know you can add it to a, a finishing you know mixer of a mm -hmm. vodka or such or even like elderflower liqueur right oh, yeah. now is really great with rosé. But even um uh you know to making a sangria or or even just sipping it you know which is what a lot of what we do here. But um yeah it's it's become. Uh, the better white zen, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I know we used to drink white Zinfandel. What was it? The spritzers. Oh, the yeah, 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 yeah. With the Sprite and a um, little bit yeah. of ice. And You'd be surprised at how many people still think that the rosé isn't sweet enough, and that's when you realize, wait a second, I think they're thinking about white zen. Oh, they probably. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That was a yeah. huge thing. 
Um, I, I love it here. And what, what made you come up with this type of design? Was it already here, the brick mm -hmm. and the beams? So I always wanted to feel, and even when we opened Boston, I always wanted the dining experience to really stay true to what I believed food and wine was really yeah. about. So I try to make the restaurants feel like an extension of my home more than that of a dining room. Mm -hmm. So when you're entering, you're really a guest in our home versus just, you know, a, a kind of a commercially designed right. space, you know. Um, while we use booths and banquettes in our style, we try to do it so it's more open and just being able to react and see people's reactions mm -hmm. to food and, and create this kind of natural conversation about what's happening in the restaurant, less intimacy. Although right. there are spots just like where we're seated yep, today that can floor. be that. Um, so I, and with, uh, with Saya specifically, because it had such success across the street, I really tried to capture every floor when I designed it to, to be respectful of what people had asked or, or you know had concerns about when we were smaller so you know having a larger table reservation you know then we have the chef's table on our second floor yeah. or being able to accommodate private events well now we're here on our third floor and we can do that um, first floor kind of sticking true to to what it was in the field that it yeah. was across the street that natural bistro that was kind of in and out and casual and it's a beautiful style. bar mm -hmm. beautiful bar yeah yeah it's, it's beautiful I love it it's beautiful and like you said it's cozy with the um, big armchairs that we in so it does make it feel like it's home yeah yeah and I'm sure when they see you you make them feel very welcome and home yeah well we're yeah. always trained and I try to tell my staff that it's really important to you know touch tables and talk to guests and make them realize yeah, exactly. that you know if their dollar is going to be spent it's spent here and it's respected and and mm. you know we recognize that they are diners and loyal and I always say uh, anytime anybody ever asks me about this industry you know everybody joins us loyal it's just whether or not we choose to keep them that way you know right. yeah um, because in the world of restaurants you know it's easier to retain than necessarily go out and capture new right yeah that's a good point mm -hmm. that's good um, advice for like future restaurant people. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, with the suburbs, um, while Newburyport's beautiful, again, like we talk about, yeah. you know, people always think of it for its seasonality. And, um, you know, Newburyport's beautiful in the fall. If you can come to Holiday Stroll the first two oh. weeks of December when all yeah. the shops are open and there's carolers, I mean, but, you know, you, again, have to, you know, work on making sure people are aware of that versus just waterfront, I'm going to go hang on a exactly. marina and on a boat come and in move in and come mm -hmm. in town. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Nancy, this is, I love this spot, and I thank want to you. thank you so much for inviting us, yeah. the Chef's Table Series crew, and supporting the Chef's Table Foundation. Oh, yeah, no problem. Thank I'm so really much. excited to have you. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> so, everyone, this has been the restaurant interview segment of the Chef's Table Series. I'm here at Sia, am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. Sia Kitchen and Bar, and we'll see you next week. I know your food is fantastic, Thank so you. I'm going to go along with whatever you say. Cool. All right, so. Uh, you got it? That's uh, almost like a, like sweet corn. That, uh, or like a, almost like a. The street, that natural bistro that was kind of in and out and casual. It's a beautiful bar. Mm -hmm. Beautiful bar. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful.